Hey, aloha and welcome to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, Stan Osterman from Tiger Shark LLC. Yeah, I got a new company, Tiger Shark LLC. So uh, I haven't got a website yet, but we're working on it. I'm not also planning to make a whole lot of money, but it may take too long. Anyways, we get started on today's show. What I'd like to do first of all is talk about some interesting things that have happened over the last couple of weeks that I think would be of interest to folks, that, that, especially folks that track hydrogen. The first is that um, if you remember back uh, to around 2008, um, hydrogen was actually a really big deal in California. Governor Schwarzenegger was doing the hydrogen highway and uh, the Bush administration was pushing uh, hydrogen as an alternative fuel and things were going great guns. And all of a sudden uh, at, the, at the Obama administration change, they put a PhD named Dr. Chu in, in charge of the Department of Energy. And for whatever reason, he decided that hydrogen wasn't ready for prime time. And he pretty much defunded the hydrogen programs that were going on in the Department of Energy. And it put the skids to a lot of states moving into hydrogen. Well, California kept it going in spite of the lack of uh, federal funding. The state government put in a bunch of funding. And of course, right now, California has about six or 7,000 hydrogen fuel cell cars on the road, and it's still pushing forward to make new stations, but it's all basically being subsidized by the state. Well, believe it or not, the federal government is kind of leaning back into hydrogen a little bit with the uh, Trump administration, even though everybody thinks he's not very environmentally savvy and he keeps talking coal and stuff, but he's actually putting money where it belongs and they're starting to look at more hydrogen and things are happening. In fact, Dr. Chu came back and said, gee, now that you can get curtailed power for two to four cents a kilowatt hour, maybe hydrogen makes sense. So all the people who slammed the brakes on in 2008 are starting to accelerate out now and really start thinking about hydrogen, especially the people who were studying it heavily and, and actually were really sold on it back in 2008. They've just, they never stopped. and Now they're accelerating out. So to that point, um, there's a company in Germany, I just found out from a, a friend, Keith Malone in California, from the California Fuel Cell Partnership, that there's a company in Germany that's building a steel plant that will run on wind turbines that make hydrogen to power the steel plant, including firing their furnaces, because they're finding that hydrogen is the cleanest gas they can get to fire these furnaces and they can do it economically with renewable wind power and hydrogen. And it's, it's amazing, it's happening all over the world. There's, there's a lot going on in Asia, there's a lot going on in Europe, especially Germany, where hydrogen is taking center stage and the price of hydrogen is dropping as they find that the more renewables you put online, the more curtailed power you have because of the, uh, the need for a lot of renewable energy that's intermittent, and all of a sudden, there's cheap power available to make hydrogen, store the energy in hydrogen, bring it back later at night uh, when the sun's not shining, and use it in stationary fuel cells. So a lot's been going on, and if you haven't kept your finger on the pulse of hydrogen, it's time to start looking at it, especially you engineers. I, I have this discussion time after time that most of our engineers are wedded to batteries, and they're wedded to diesel generators. Diesel generators are just getting way too expensive with the, with the tier four uh, genera uh, generators that you have to use to be clean. They're not gonna get any more efficient. In fact, cleaning them up is all aftermarket stuff and it, it takes away from the, the uh, power that you're putting in, you're getting out of the generator. So engineers wake up, start smelling the hydrogen roses and start thinking hydrogen and fuel cells for your work. So today's guest is uh, Chris McWinney, not a stranger to Stan the Energy Man. He's on often, and um, I, I asked him to come back on because he's working on a project we'll talk about in the second half of the show. But in the first part of the show, he was at a conference with uh, myself, Paul Pontio, and a bunch of other uh, smart folks that um, were talking ocean thermal and renewable energy uh, at, in Kona as part of the Okinawa Hawaii uh, Clean Energy Symposium. So Chris, welcome to the show. I'm glad you could be on. And uh, why don't you tell the audience just a little, a quick synopsis, uh, if they haven't seen you before, of uh, what you do and, and your company. 
Thanks, Dan, for having me. Yes, uh, my name is Chris McQuinney. I'm in Dayton, Ohio. I'm CEO of a company called Millennium Marine Energy, and we build hydrogen fueling infrastructure and deploy it um, across the country. And we have um, 16 uh, models that are uh, have uh, what's called a certificate of attestation from CSA Group, uh, meaning that they meet all the codes and standards necessary to, in order to put those products out and and uh, do it safely and within the codes and standards. And um, we've been in business for about since 2003, actually started it at our garage at my house. And then 2013, we bought a 40,000 square foot building and we've been working out of there ever since. And um, so we have quite a few uh, projects going on. And uh, one of them is the transcontinental hydrogen highway. All right. What, you know, we we're at that symposium uh, last week. Is there anything that stood out um, in your mind that you think is, uh, you know, in the category of game changer that came up during that conference? Well, I think it was interesting to hear people talking about how they really needed to store large scale uh, energy and that, um, you know, it's not just batteries and it's not just hydrogen it really has to be both working together uh, in order to accomplish that uh, the batteries give you a uh, quick on and off uh, and the ability to follow loads uh, and ramp up and down um, and then the hydrogen gives you the long-term storage that you need and so it was good to hear people talking about those kind of things and um, I think that was really probably the biggest thing yeah, I agree. And, uh, you know, Paul made the comment to your point that um, if you start looking at lithium cobalt technology, which is basically your Tesla wall and, and that kind of battery, um, the cost is around $600 per kilowatt hour of storage. But when you look at hydrogen scaling to large scale, it's closer to $100 or less per kilowatt hour. So six times cheaper than batteries. And, the, and mm -hmm. as you mentioned, the, the right thing to do is to put the right mix in. In fact, I would even add flywheels or ultra capacitors to the equation for batteries and say, you could probably use ultra capacitors or, and or flywheels to do that quick. Um, if there's a big inrush power requirement to, to take up that load instantly within milliseconds and uh, get, yeah. get the power up and then let your uh, other generation catch up, including fuel cells. And, and I think that's the way to do it. And, you know, your company, um, I, I put out there on the introduction to the show, that your company has a little different philosophy on how to attack the infrastructure um, issue with hydrogen generation. And of course, you need a lot of the hydrogen made in California for the vehicles is steam reform methane. And, and if you did that from renewable um, biogas or something like that, um, that's, that's probably a good way to, to negate the methane uh, greenhouse gas. But to really make a clean hydrogen, it's electrolysis, and that's where your equipment comes in. But your philosophy is to start small and grow it as the market grows. And the other companies, mostly the big electrolyzer companies, they want to go in big and make these big hydrogen stations that cost millions of dollars and the market's not there yet. And then that's a challenge for investors. That's a challenge for permitting. So explain to everyone how important your technology is, uh, number one, to scale, and number two, the fact that it's an appliance, not a, uh, it's not like you have to build a facility for it. It's on a pallet, you just drop it in place, hook up water and electricity, and you're off and running, kind of like a refrigerator, more than a big, big building. Yeah, right. Well, it's uh, first. It's really important to um, to to make anything spread across a nation or across the world. Uh, you have to have your finances in order, and um, if you don't have a product that um, doesn't always need to have some type of government subsidy to make it fly, um, you know. <laughs> it's difficult to continue to grow, um, you know, a business that way and depend on the government. So we, we, we think that when you take a 
product like a hydrogen generator and you combine it with the, the five things that you need in infrastructure development are hydrogen production, hydrogen purification, hydrogen um, uh, compression, storing the hydrogen and dispensing it. And we package all that together in one product. And by doing it on a smaller scale, you can better match the demand for the hydrogen um, with the supply. And, and instead of the way things are going in California, often they have, um, they have to put out a big station because that's the way the government rules work as far as who gets the, the, the grants. And um, so they have to put out a large station to qualify for that. And then you've just put out a new station and there may not be enough cars around to, to, to consume all the hydrogen that they can dispense. So then they can't sell enough hydrogen to make money. So if you can match the supply and the demand more closely, you can sell all the hydrogen you can make. And then with the right um, cost for energy input for kilowatt hour electricity, um, you can actually make a financial case that you can uh, put out infrastructure that will uh, make it profitable. And so then people want to buy stations because they can make money selling hydrogen. And then with the right cost per kilowatt hour, you can actually get the hydrogen in certain states like California and Hawaii and in certain countries like Europe where the price of the hydrogen is actually less than the um, cost of gasoline. So now instead of just saying, hey, it's green and it's sustainable and it's renewable and you know, selling to that market, you can sell to be able to affect somebody economically um, by saving money on fuel costs. And, and then ultimately those two things have to be done within us where they can make money. And now you can grow an organization organically rather than having to always raise capital or borrow money or get grants and those kind of things. So that's the primary reason to start small and grow it big. Um, and, and then we've taken the extra step to, we're the first company in the world to have the CSA groups uh, attestation uh, where we have a certificate that, you know, says that we meet all the codes and standards and that we can fill the car safely. Um, and in doing that process, we got it classified as an appliance. and because um, just in the United States alone, uh, on the mainland, there's like 3,800 counties. And could you imagine what it would be like to go to every authority with jurisdiction and try to explain to them how hydrogen works? Uh, you know, this kind of helps skip over that process when they see you hand them a certificate that says, this has already been checked by an internationally recognized third-party testing laboratory. And, uh, it's qualified as an appliance, so it can just be dropped off and plugged in and used. Um, so um, that will, I think, help in um, uh, the deployment of hydrogen fueling infrastructure in this manner. So then in, in, after that, you start small. We, already, we have four products that are already certified that one's bigger than the next and bigger than the next and bigger than the next. So you can actually move these things around very easily because they're an appliance. Um, and you can take the one that got you started and found a hot location and move it to find another hot location while you put in a bigger system in its place. So all together collectively, that's our philosophy. We've went out and done this. This is not something we're talking about doing. We're done with it. You can look at our website at mreh2.com and see, see all the different products that we've got done. Yeah, and, and I'd like to let the, the audience know that um, that uh, I when I worked at HCAT, we were one of your first customers. I think we have uh, serial number two of your of your what is it two hundred um, series uh, electrolyzers and stations. And you know we're going to take a quick break here, but when we come back, I, I want to talk a little bit about price because 
I know our station when we when we got it was just over a hundred thousand dollars. It was around one hundred twenty thousand dollars for the basic yeah. station, and I ordered extra storage so that we'd have a little more flexibility on the storage. So let's yeah. uh, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back after the break, and we'll we'll talk about how affordable this is compared to the station the other stations that are out there now. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just kind of scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Stan Osterman and Chris McWinney talking about Chris's Millennium Rain um, electrolyzer systems that uh, not only make hydrogen cleanly by taking power, electric power and water and splitting the water, but they also um, scrub the hydrogen and make sure it's uh, all the oxygen and any moisture is separated out of it. Uh, compresses the hydrogen, which is five nines pure by the time it gets to the storage stores the hydrogen, and then uses standard dispensing equipment that'll, that'll fit any, um, any uh, Toyota or Honda or Hyundai hydrogen vehicle that are currently in production, and you can dispense right into the vehicle from this station. So, uh, Chris, you know, we, we talked about how important it is to, uh, to have the hydrogen scalable so to meet the market, but the price on yours is also a big deal. And if we can use that curtailed power from uh, renewable energy, um, where it's being made out in the community, um, we have a, a, real, a real chance to make a, a huge difference because if we can get that electricity here in Hawaii down under 10 cents a kilowatt hour, we're starting to be competitive with gasoline. And certainly if we can get it down in the four or five cents a kilowatt hour like uh, you can on the mainland in many places, um, you're actually beating the current price of gasoline. So. You know, let's talk a little bit about that and maybe what your plan is for the continental U.S. Yeah, so um, the, the price of the product, uh, we range, we have a Model 100, a Model 200, and a Model 300. And then we have what we call a Mega 4 TA70. And the prices range from between um, $120,000 up to uh, $500,000. Uh, depending on the amount of volume that they produce. So the lowest one does four kilograms a day and has eight kilograms of storage. And the biggest one has 60 kilograms of storage and produces 64 kilograms a day. And um, uh, so uh, we've got quite a range there. And, and because of the, <clears throat> the, 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 the capital cost being reduced, um, that greatly affects the, um, the, the cost to the hydrogen at the nozzle uh, that then can be marked up for a profit and sold onto the customer at a discount to what they're buying gasoline at. So um, those those are some big uh, competitive advantages that we have when it comes to how this all lays out is making it cost effective. So in some of the models that you showed us last week, you showed Paul and I, um, even at the small scale end, there's actually a, a return on investment around the 2% range, not really big. And you're selling hydrogen, yeah. probably a little bit more than gasoline price. But that again, that's, yeah. that's when you have a really small demand signal for the hydrogen. But as you get up a little yeah. higher to maybe four or five cars a day, you know, we move up to your second or third tier of uh, generation. Now you're, you're getting into 4%, 9% return on investment and you're selling your hydrogen cheaper than this in California, and you're still making 
you know, good, good profit. So it's, it's your model right. to me looks like it makes a whole huge amount of sense because as soon as you can get, you know, a reasonable number of customers, you're already in a, at a place where you're competitive with the current prices of, uh, of gasoline. And, you know, right now with fracking and, uh, you know, to get most of our domestic oil, um, those wells don't produce as long as our traditional wells. And I think people are just going to start noticing the price of oil creeping up slowly um, as we basically lose our supply. And what we don't want to do is cut our supply down to where oil is really expensive domestically and then become dependent on foreign oil again. And we're back in the same energy security debacle that we've been in for years where we're, we're fighting wars and we're doing all kinds of stuff to keep our oil supply going. Right. Right. So one of the things that dawned on me there when you were talking is, is that um, one of the reasons that we're able to do what we do and others are not is because we're taking also a different approach in strategy as far as delivering the gas to the vehicle. Um, the stations in around the world that are being deployed right now are all at 10,000 PSI and they want to fill the cars in five minutes. And in order to do that, you have to pre-chill the hydrogen at, down to minus 20, minus 30, or minus 40 Celsius. And that takes a lot of extra energy. It makes the cost of hydrogen more because the equipment costs more. And um, it's three times more to put a 10,000 PSI station together than it is a 5,000 PSI station because all the parts for compression and the fittings and the tubing and the tanks, storage tanks, um, all those components are not widely available at 10,000 PSI. So you pay a premium for them. And so uh, we, we our, our approach is at 5,000 PSI. So your car is only going to get a half a fill and you're going to go half as far. You're going to have to fill up twice as much. Um, but we think the consumer will do that because some is better than none. And the way they're currently doing it, it will not self-propagate. It, it, we want to be able to grow organically um, uh, and, and have the growth occur naturally because the demand is there and, and it's affordable. Um, if the government decides to fund it on money, um, the current the current uh, way that is being uh, done is not going to last. So, um, so there is a sacrifice for doing it our way, and it's important that people understand that. Yeah. And that we think it's worth it. I, I wouldn't call it a sacrifice so much as, you know, I, I think as a habit, um, I, I, I can tell you for certain that as a National Guardsman, uh, I never let my tank go below a half on my truck or my car. Um, because here in Hawaii, um, we could have an earthquake on the big island that could cause a tsunami that would impact our island, and we'd have 20 minutes to react to it. You don't have time to go fill up, uh, you know, 800,000 cars at gas stations in 20 minutes, because after that, you, you'll have a shortage of electricity and gasoline on the island. So I always keep my tank half full uh, or more, and, you know, that's, that's where I fill up. But, you know, you, you, you could do the same thing here and say, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill up and always have a, have a half a tank in there and, and stop more often. You know, I, I, I live on the windward side of the island, and it takes me, I never buy gas in my neighborhood. Uh, the, the closest gas station that I get gas from is uh, the Costco here in Honolulu. But I do it because it saves me uh, money, and it's 30 mm -hmm. miles away from, or 15 miles away from my house, so 30 miles round trip. And um, it's not a problem. When I'm in town, I fill up. Today, I filled up with some hydro or some gasoline, and uh, could do the same thing with hydrogen. And you know, and you get yeah. 150 mile range on an island uh, here in Hawaii. That's that's plenty of range, and uh, it's yeah. equal to even the smaller uh, battery plug-in vehicles that are, uh, you know, accused of having range anxiety. It's 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 more than they they get. Oh you know, yeah, still it's still, still my batteries and. Um... Uh, with the exception of the Tesla, um, you're, 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 you're getting an eight minute fill and you're going 150 to 170 miles. So um, it's still much better than any of that. I just wanted to be clear that there is a reason that we're that much cheaper um, and, and people have to buy into that argument. But I think they are. And you mentioned the uh, transcontinental hydrogen highway. Um, 
we're going to be deploying 27 stations from Los Angeles, California to New York City. And um, we're going to be the first company um, uh, that we know of that will be able to claim that they have um, crossed a continent and allowed you to drive um, from one ocean to another ocean. Um, and I think that's going to be a really important feature or, uh, you know, accomplishment to wake up the world to see that it doesn't have to cost as much as what it's being, you know, touted. And so in preparation for that, we have just completed the very first um, triangular highway. Um, we call it the Ohio Hydrogen Triangle um, from Columbus, Ohio to Dayton, Ohio and down to Portsmouth, Ohio. One leg is 122 miles, another one's 90 miles, and another one is 75 miles. And we have stations in all three locations, and we have five vehicles that we're able to drive in between them. And so I've been driving a hydrogen car now for about, uh, about three or four weeks, and um, it's pretty cool to be able to see that, you know, this thing that we're going to do across the country is working here locally in, in the state of Ohio. And, 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 it, and it really is giving me a lot of confidence that we're on the right track. So we're going to take advantage of this, uh, the small work together and really collect a lot of data and, and really understand um, what's the best way to fill the cars. Do we need to spend just a little bit of extra money and put a cascade system in them? It only gives you about a 10% more, but you know, 10% of 150, you know, the 15 miles. So that might be important to somebody. And so, you know, those kind of questions we're going to be able to answer. And we're really excited about having you to do that. Yeah. And, and just so everybody knows too, you, you are, you do have the technology built already to go to the fulfill um, when you get to like the megawatt scale uh, electrolyzers. And, you know, and at that point though, you'll be able to, um, to do the 10,000 PSI pressure and be able to afford the stations because you're already at that market where you have the customers to support that biggest station and make it cost effective. Yeah. So, so that's important, important yeah, for everybody to understand. It is. We're not saying we don't want to do 10,000. We're just saying there's a right time and a right place for it. And the way exactly. we look at it is you get enough customers coming in and all of a sudden you change your station to do 10,000. You're selling twice as much gas to the same people. So that's a totally different value proposition because you already know the market exists and you know there's so you automatically know what your numbers are going to be. It's not a question of if. Uh, but it's a question of when. So when do you actually deploy the 10,000 puzzle? And we already have that built. So um, we'll see what happens when you get a financial advisor and a financial planner that starts doing innovative, uh, innovative hydrogen infrastructure. It starts to make business sense. Well, Chris, I want to thank you for uh, being on the show today. Believe it or not, we blasted through 30 minutes and I want to thank you for uh, bringing us up to speed on, uh, on your vision. And I think it's a, a valid thing. And I, I hope that you can get your, uh, your business plan out there for other investors to look at so they can understand how much sense it makes. Because uh, we've, we've shown it to other people and they shake their head up and down and go, hey, this makes a lot of sense. So thanks for being with us. Right. And I'll, we'll have you back on in a few months and, and get caught up a little bit more on how Millennium Range is doing. Yeah, as you know, we're looking for investors right now to help support this. Uh, and so... Uh, I appreciate you saying something about that. All right. Okay. Well, until next Tuesday, Stan Lerner's your man signing off. Aloha.